Okay, this is a presentation on intrinsic safety and hazardous areas. Again, another very quick introduction. Um, contact us for all the slides. But basically, just want to focus on intrinsic safety, but because this is part of the hazardous areas, I just need to run through this. This is part of our regular series of courses, and um, this little introduction will take about 10, 10, 12 minutes, but obviously the slides are considerably more, so you're welcome to go through um, the issues there. So really the objectives here are obviously to look at terminology and then fundamentals of intrinsic safety, just some of the main core issues there. So explosion protection definition, obviously the measures applied in the construction of electrical apparatus to prevent ignition. Obviously you don't want an explosion if you're on a platform or even in a um, gas uh, service station. You want to make sure that um, everything's protected. Um, in fact, even your car is um, hazardous because it's got a petrol tank and we've all seen cars on the side of the road which have um, burnt out. So obviously a big issue there. So I've really thought about safety and uh, dealing with dangerous situations and trying to ensure that we reduce the risk obviously within controllable boundaries. Now, there's only three things that will cause an explosion, three components to cause an explosion. You need fuel, so you need sufficient vapor, gas, hydrogen, source of ignition, a, um, something which will ignite the explosion, and then obviously oxygen. So if you don't have one of these three components, you won't have an explosion. So one or two of the three is not adequate, you need all three. So obviously oxygen uh, is critical. Even if you've got hydrogen, you need oxygen with the ignition source. So um, electricity is obviously a very good um, source. Sparks, um, heat, source of ignition. Um, we had a hazardous situation developing recently with um, a guy using an angle grinder. So obviously he's de developing um, sparks. Here's a spark ignition characteristic. So on your y-axis, you've got uh, ignition energy, millijoules. And then you've got the actual concentration here. So if you look at hydrogen, for example, you get a particular curve looking like this. Um, that's your upper explosion limit, and obviously the lower explosion limit. Explosive limits for materials, um, propane is 2%. After explosion limit is 9.5%, and the minimum energy, 180 microjoules, uh, as you can see, pretty um, low level of energy to cause an explosion. Hydrogen, as you can see there, you, require, you can go up to 76%, and your low explosion limit is actually a bit higher than propane. Ignition temperature, another important term used, lowest temperature of a thermal gas at which ignition occurs. Sometimes you hear use the term auto-ignition or spontaneous ignition. So below that temperature you will not have um, ignition. Flash point is the temperature which uh, at the free surface of a liquid and has su sufficient vapor to be ignited by a small flame. So for example a flash point of kerosene or paraffin sometimes is 38 degrees, the ignition temperature is 210 degrees. So the important thing is only liquids have flash points. Because as we say, we use the definition uses the word liquid. So anything below that flash point, no hazard at all. So that's an important definition. Uh, typically hydrogen sulfide is often referred to as rotten egg smell. Um, the concentration uh, where you can smell something is 0.1 parts per million, so it's actually pretty low. Safe working level is 10 parts per million, so you can sort of tolerate that. But a serious health le level, uh, danger level is 50 parts per million, and obviously um, the lower flammable limit is 40,000 parts per minute, and upper flammable level 460,000 parts per million. Um, if you classify an area or do area classification, you need to look at the nature of the hazard, the location of the hazard, and the probability of the presence. 
So um, nature of the hazards is gas classification, ignition temperature, and the probability that hazardous uh, atmosphere will be present is area classification. So uh, the requirement for equipment is obviously the maximum spark energy you can produce, the apparatus group, and the maximum surface temperature, temperature classification. So these are two important issues. So gas classification, you'll see it's broken down into two countries, Europe or Asia Pacific, Australia for example, South Africa, IEC, and use this terminology here, group one and two, whereas USA and Canada use the term class one, group A, B, C, D, um, but you can see there cross mapping between the two. Fibers and flyings, no classification IEC, but with the USA, but class three, and then you've got obviously uh, dust, flower, which is also as hazardous, um, is class two, group E, F, G, and the USA, and um, in the um, IC, it's a one, two, four, one standard. And obviously, um, the easier to ignite is obviously acetylene, and the least likely to ignite are fibers and flyings. Temperature classification, you can see here T1, T2, T3, T4, T6, and as your T uh, grouping goes higher, T6, you've only you've got 85 degrees, whereas with T1, you've got 450 degrees. Temperature classification in North America, unfortunately, is different. And here you've got T1, T2, T2A, and a particular rating, 85 degrees to 450 degrees. So again, you need to know those um, classifications, otherwise you won't be able to interpret it. Gas ignition temperature, as you can see, ammonia is 630 degrees, all the way to carbon disulfide, which is 105 degrees. And on this side, we've got the apparatus temperature classification, T1, all the way to T6. Properties of gases. Um, again, another chart, you can see propane, vapor density 1.56, all the way to acetone 2. Um, and then you've got your T classification group here on the side. This is extract from the IC60079. Area classification, now this is really important. You've got three zones, zone 0, 1, and 2. This, this is something that everyone needs to know, whether you work in hazardous area or not. A zone 0 is where you've got an exposure of gas, air, mixture, continuously present or present for long periods. So basically it's there all the time. Um, zone 1 is an explosive gas air mixture is likely to occur in normal operation. And then finally, zone 2 is where an explosive gas air mixture is not likely to occur in normal operation. It will only occur for a short time if it ever does occur. So those three zones are very important, basically for the IEC, European, Asia, Pacific, African countries. On the other hand, you get, well, you can get Division 1 and Division 2. Um, and Division 1 is equivalent to Zone 0 and 1, and Zone 2 is equivalent to Division 2. So Division 1 is hazardous area, hazardous atmosphere is likely to be present in normal operation, and hazardous atmosphere is not unlikely to be present in normal operation. So sometimes you hear the term Div 1, Zone 0, sometimes specified. And here's an example of a class area classification. Um, over here, zone 2, unlikely to occur. So it's quite far outside the Bund, Bund wall. Here you've got a um, zone 1, because gas occurs during normal operation. And then zone 0, just above it there, of course, um, that's probably the most hazardous, and that occurs all the time, basically, because it's above the liquid surface. Notice the liquid itself is not classified because you can't actually have an explosion within the liquid um, and the normal circumstances. Here's another diagram. As you can see, uh, zone 1 around the Bund wall, zone 2 4.5 meters away from the Bund, and then right around the tank you've got um, zone 0. So 
around the pipes. Very important. Boundary fence. Four flow valves, zone one in the pipe trench, zone two, three meters across. Here's another example, thermocouple in a hazardous area. The, within the tank you've got zone zero, inside a pipe, pipe or process vessel. Zone one, just outside the process vessel. And then finally zone two, outside the pipe. Area classification is probability of gas air mixture being present, zone zero or one or two, according to IC standards. Probability of source of ignition, uh, matched to type of protection, and then of course acceptable risk. Obviously, nothing is 100% safe, but the question is whether you are prepared to pay for that. Obviously, at the end of the day, we all die, and there's always the possibility of a um, uh, risk of whatever situation you are. It's just a question of whether it's acceptable or not. So I'm just going to briefly spend a few minutes talking about intrinsic safety over here, which is the IC 7911, 60079-11. Um, and it's quite a useful term to use. So I just want to spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, intrinsic basically means inbuilt or of its nature. So it's built into the system. And intrinsic safety is quite simple to consider. It's a circuit where no spark or thermal effect any part of the circuit intended for use in hazardous areas capable of causing ignition. So basically what we're trying to do is restrict energy going into a hazardous area. And that's why it's quite a powerful method of uh, protection. So here we have a particular circuit used for intrinsic safety. Here's your voltage input coming in. And of course it's restricted by a xenodiode and a current limit resistor to protect limiting the energy into this area where I put a question mark. Um, so here's a typical example. Here's a safe area. You're generating the energy to push into the hazardous area and you're looking at a current limiting resistor and a xenodiode to keep that voltage fixed. So it's quite a uh, clever system. If it has this area, you're restricting the amount of energy going into there so it's safe at all times. So intrinsically safety with two countable faults, zero, 01, zero, 01 and 2, and intrinsic safety with one countable fault um, is zero, zones 1 and 2. So don't worry about that. Here's a typical system. Here's your power coming through and uh, relay. Here's the hazardous area. And of course you're restricting the energy, constant voltage and a a um, resistor. And uh, the other point to make here is that note the earth connection. There, earth, uh, sorry, there. It's neutral. That's earth there. Very important grounding. Working. Current limiting from a constant CD sense or constant voltage supply. Here's your supply. Relay. Barrier. Your intrinsic safety barrier. And of course, here's your hazardous area. So again, current limiting voltage restricted to a certain voltage, constant voltage. If you have a um, failure of a component, um, you can have fuse here and obviously current limiting resistor. Again, trying to make sure at all costs there's no energy, excessive energy into the hazardous area. So that just gives you a quick rundown on some of the key concepts in hazardous areas and obviously in um, a brief mention of hazardous series. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please drop me a line at Steve McKay from Engineering Institute of Technology and IEC Technologies. Cheers. Bye.